Welcome back to the Idaho Victory Garden. This week we're going to be focusing on tree fruits, which have some special needs compared to growing berries that we discussed last week. We, we've broken up the presentations into three groups. This first presentation will focus on apples and pears. The next one will be uh, peaches and nectarines. And the last one will be uh, cherries and I think plums. So follow along with us, uh, watch whichever one you want, watch all three. We've also included some video on how to prune fruit trees and a, a few other useful references for solving problems. So when you're starting out from scratch with fruit trees, there are a few things that you want to consider. If you're looking at your property, try to avoid the low-lying areas if you're establishing a new home orchard. This is because frost will settle in those low areas and you're also more likely to get poor drainage. It also goes without saying not to situate your orchard on a septic drain field or anywhere where you've had issues in the past with drainage or flooding. These can all lead to diseases, root rot, and things like that. And again, with the frost, you really want to plant, if you're going to plant, plant on a slope or plant on the higher ground so that frost doesn't settle there and damage blossoms or young fruit. So if you are starting from scratch, you have a whole world of cultivars and varieties out there to choose from, and it really pays to do your homework. This is a plant that you may have for your entire lifetime. So use some thought and care into choosing some varieties that will be best for your area, for your needs in how you're going to use that fruit, and also perhaps disease or pest resistance. And we've included a list of some recommended varieties for North versus South Idaho, and hopefully you'll find some great options there and be able to find them at some local nurseries or through mail, over, mail order. We also really want to con you to consider using a dwarf or a semi-dwarf tree whenever possible, and we'll talk about the differences between those and why you might choose those kinds. Uh, but what if you have trees already? Maybe you didn't plant them, maybe they were there on your property when you moved in. Some things to think about. Really look objectively at those trees. Take sentiment aside, take, um, you know, sort of a sense of responsibility for those trees away, and think, are these trees really earning their keep? Are they producing high quality, delicious fruit? Are they worth the time and energy it goes in to try to rehabilitate them or to care for them? Maybe you can't even get up into the branches without a ladder. Um, unless that fruit is really spectacular or you really do have some kind of sentimental value attached to the tree. Maybe it was planted by a relative or a friend or something like that. It's okay to take them out and replace them. Uh, you can do that sometimes even without taking out the whole tree. You might actually graft a new variety into the existing tree. That's an option. And if you really need to keep those trees, how do you prevent or treat problems without replanting? And we are going to address some of the major issues in this, in this talk, but uh, our links are going to have more information for you. So let's get talking about apples and pears in particular. We love apples and pears. They are the quintessential fruit come harvest time, early fall. Just want to have that delicious crisp apple or pear to bite into. But apples and pears can bring with them a lot of work, especially in the home garden. So if you're going to add these fruits to your, your backyard plot, you want to do some careful consideration and weigh the risks and benefits. So here's where we're going to talk about the size. So a standard or a seedling tree, so this would be if you planted your apple seeds and this is what grew, we're talking about a tree that can reach up to 60 feet tall. They can be big, they can be unmanageable, uh, and it can take up to 10 years to bear. So if someone's offering you a free apple that just happened to sprout in their backyard and they think, well, here's a free tree. That free tree is not really all that free it's going to come with some problems. And also, uh, apples do not produce true from seed. So just because you have a seed of a Honeycrisp apple doesn't mean that the offspring is going to be identical to the parent. That's why fruit trees are often grafted. So you're taking a risk that in 10 years you might get an apple that may or may not be even edible. Uh, Semi-dwarf trees can reach about 25 feet. These are nice if you want your tree to uh, do double duty as a shade tree and a fruit producing tree. But again, it's going to be a little bit harder to manage and you might have to wait five to seven years for a good harvest. So for most backyard orchards or small gardens, or if you're going to be growing intensively, a dwarf tree is really your best choice. These max out at 15 feet. You can keep them a little bit smaller with pruning 
and they will bear in three to five years. So those are all wins. A little bit about pollination. Yes, most apples and pears are going to require a source of pollen nearby. So this can be another variety grafted on the same tree. So you might have uh, one of those fruit cocktail trees or a tree that has a couple varieties of apple or pear all in the same tree. Great, that'll do your pollinating. Also, crab apples can pollinate most apples as long as they're blooming at the same time. And so look around your neighborhood as well. If there are any fruit trees within, say, a quarter mile that are flowering or at the same time as yours, so apples or pears, then they may be a uh, prospective pollinator for you. And uh, some of them, including the seckle pear, is actually self-fruitful and doesn't need a pollinator. So you can do a lot with your apples and pears. You don't just have to grow the traditional tree. And we see a lot of this in uh, European gardens and also in commercial orchards now. So this picture on the bottom left, this is a commercial orchardist in the sunny slope area of Southern Idaho. And he's growing high density apples. So he's planting very, very small dwarf trees very close together and pruning them intensively so that all that harvest is really kept to uh, uh, the height where people don't have to be on ladders or trucks to harvest, and they're very easy to take care of. The picture on the right is a beautiful example of an espalier, or this is a trained tree. So just with pruning, um, bending, and uh, wiring those branches to a frame framework or um, a series of trellises, you can actually train the tree to grow that way and look at how easy that would be to harvest, prune, and to care for. Plus it just looks nice. It's a living fence. And columnar is another type of tree that grows very narrow so you can fit more of them in a space and the fruit is really all condensed and kept close to the trunk. Uh, however, apples do have some issues and if you've grown home apples or have someone who has Likely you've seen a picture that looks like the one on the right, and this is the codling moth. That moth is not shown actual size. It's actually a very, very small moth. It mates in early, early summer, late spring, lays its eggs on the fruit. The uh, caterpillar hatches and starts tunneling through the apple, and what's left is its waste products where you see there that sting on the green apple. So sometimes the worm is still inside when you eat the apple, sometimes it's not, but really the quality and certainly the marketability of those apples would be gone. What can we do to fight the moth? I wish that there was a single magic bullet or, or magic spray that was destined to take care of it, but the truth is it's very hard to manage the moth with just one method. We usually use a combination of methods and we use a little bit of science on our side. So sanitation, just cleaning up any of the dropped fruit that has these, the stings or the evidence of the moth, getting rid of those. You can purchase pheromone traps, and these actually will trap the adult males and let you know that the moth is active and currently looking for mates. And that is the best time to start uh, timing your protective sprays. If you live in the, in the southwest part of the state, you can actually sign up to get alerts from our pnwpestalert.net website and we will often send out alerts when the traps have been um, showing evidence of the moths and you can take action. So there are a lot of choices for you as far as chemicals. There are both organic and synthetic insecticides that are labeled for use against codling moths and are fairly effective as long as they're applied at the right time and continually applied because you have multiple generations a year of the moth. So protecting yourself is key. And the last thing I want to mention is that it is possible to physically protect each fruit with a paper or a nylon bag. It sounds like a lot of work, and it is, but it is a completely organic and 100% effective way to do it. So maybe you have a very small tree, and maybe you have 50 to 75 gorgeous Honeycrisp apples on there, and you really want to protect them. It could be worth it. So another common disease that we deal with all around the state is fire blight. And this is a bacterial disease, actually, and it affects the, um, the stems and the growing tips. And what you'll see is this, it looks like the tree has been burnt or scorched, and that's why it's called fire blight. It spreads very quickly. It usually shows up in um, early to mid-summer, and it affects apples, crab apples, pears, and other trees in the same family. It does not affect cherries, plums, apricots, any of those, they're in a different family, but anything in the apple or pear family, it does affect. 
What do you do when you have fire blight? Well, by the time you see it, you really are limited on your options. One of the things that you can do is prune out any of the affected tissue. So anywhere you see that, that uh, shepherd's crook or that blackened foliage, you can cut it out. But make sure that you cut back about 12 inches beyond where you see the damage. And very, very important that you sterilize your pruning tools between cuts. That's actually one of the ways that you spread fire blight when you don't know you have it is by pruning tree to tree to tree, you take that, uh, that bacteria with you. If you know that you've had fire blight and you wanna go get on a more preventative schedule, then you can use a copper-based spray during the dormant season. So when the tree is asleep in the winter or early, early spring, and then there are some bactericides or antibiotics that you can use on those trees during bloom time. And there are both organic and synthetic versions. And we're going to include a link for you to our Pacific Northwest Insect and Disease Handbooks. And these have very specific annually updated recommendations for both treatment um, options and chemicals, both organic and synthetic, that are approved for use in home orchards. So that's a really good reference point for you to go if you're having these problems because sometimes um, availability or licensing of products varies from year to year so that book is really a good resource. So a few other things that apples can have happen to them and that would be aphids, those tiny sap sucking insects. They tend to really like the new fresh leaves of apples. Again this is usually not a major problem, it doesn't have that much of an effect on fruit quality and aphids can be controlled with insecticidal soaps or a, a steady stream of water uh, or sometimes just waiting for the natural enemies to show up. Powdery mildew is a fungal disease. Again, often when we have uh, overhead watering or a really humid environment under the tree canopy, we can get a little powdery mildew. Scale insects, these will usually be along the trunk or on uh, the branches. And again, soaps or a dormant oil in the spring can really help with that, as well as rust fungus. And then iron deficiency we looked at in uh, when we talked about our soils unit, if you remember back. But apples growing in high alkaline soils or in overly wet soils can sometimes show symptoms of iron deficiency. And in that case, sometimes you just change your management practices so that they are getting less water, or you apply a foliar-based chelated iron product. So uh, just a little bit of a mention on pruning. We do have linked a video that demonstrates very specifically pruning apples and other tree fruits. But just remember that fruit is produced on two-year-old wood. And so if you prune too hard every year, then you may actually be removing your fruiting wood. And also the more you prune, the more that tree is gonna grow. So go kind of slowly. And especially when you're dealing with an old neglected tree, don't make large changes at once. Take, you know, maybe a third of what you would want to take out of that tree each season, and that will reduce stress on the tree, and it'll also avoid that overstimulation of growth. So that's what we have on apples and pears to get you started. We hope that you will look at some of the other resources and watch the pruning video.